purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. In today's episode, we will visit two different corners of our planet. While these places are thousands of kilometers apart, spiritually, they are more like close relatives. Our first stop is Ethiopia in East Africa. It is dissected by the Great African Rift Valley, which is considered by many to be the cradle of humankind. In Ethiopia, we will also encounter a hyena herdsman. After that, we will cross the Atlantic Ocean to a country which surprisingly has a lot in common with East Africa. Rastafarians from Jamaica believe that the Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie, believed to be the Black Messiah, led his people to the promised land, Ethiopia. Watching in awe as the Duns River Falls and YS Falls tumble down, it feels like Jamaica could be a paradise on Earth. The dawn of human history most likely began somewhere here, by the lakes of the great East African Rift Valley. Five million years ago, East Africa began parting from the rest of the continent. At the same time, the dense jungle began disappearing and was replaced by pastures, plains, deserts, forests, rivers, and lakes. The landscape became similar to what we see today. These changes to the landscape forced our predecessors to stand on their rear two legs. An upright position enabled them to see much further in the tall grass of the savanna, and so they could spot potential prey or predators easier. Dissolved alkaline rocks give the brownish color to Langana Lake, which is said to resemble English tea with milk. Due to the particular chemical composition of the water, people may bathe and fish here without fear of getting infected with schistosomiasis, an otherwise debilitating disease. The great East African Rift Valley goes from the Red Sea through Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, all the way to the mouth of the Zambezi River. Some 150 years ago, Darwin proclaimed, the first human being was an African. We may encounter one of the oldest predecessors of the human race in Ethiopia. All we have to do is visit the National Museum. In 1974, the American paleontologist Don Johansson discovered one of the most significant hominid remains ever found. It was an almost intact skeleton of the three million year old species Australopithecus afarensis. The skeleton, named Lucy, belonged to a woman who drowned. Thanks to the volcanic mud in which the bones were trapped, it remained extremely well preserved. The skeleton is known the world over as Lucy after the Beatles hit Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which was often heard on the radio at the time. The Ethiopians called it Denkenesh, which may be translated as, you are amazing. A more recent monument of human civilization can be found on a plain near the village of Tia. These stone stelae were erected sometime between the 10th and 14th century AD. Unfortunately, we still do not know by whom. It may have been a burial site as some skeletal remains were uncovered nearby, but we haven't deciphered the exact meaning of the carved symbols yet. We may only assume that the wavy lines depict breasts and the reliefs of swords depict warriors. This mysterious place was added to the UNESCO World Heritage Site List in 1980. Teff, or lovegrass, is the tiniest cereal in the world. Its grains are plentiful in protein. In Ethiopia, it's the staple diet for at least two-thirds of the population. Domesticated animals help the local farmers in its processing. Cattle tread on the harvested grains until the grains are separated from the stems and husks. There's no need for electricity. Dung is a welcome side product of this processing technique. Once shaped and dried properly, it becomes a much desired source of fuel. Coffee bushes are often planted beneath fully grown trees called coffee mamas to provide the much needed shade. 
coffee bush has stunning white flowers, which ripen into berries not unlike cherries. Each contains two coffee grains, which are removed when dry. The locals are very experienced in growing this plant. Ethiopia is a country renowned for its coffee export. It makes up for two-thirds of the country's foreign exchange income. The expression coffee actually comes from the earlier name of the Kaffa province. The Rastafarian movement blends aspects of traditional Jamaican faith with elements of the Old Testament. The Jamaican leader, Marcus Garvey, predicted the arrival of a black messiah. When Rastafari Makonan became Ethiopia's emperor, he accepted the name Haile Selassie. Thus, for many, this prophecy came true. Over 2,000 Rastafarians moved to Ethiopia over the last 50 years. The followers of this peculiar faith do not eat meat or drink alcohol. They revere the sacred plant marijuana and sing songs celebrating the Lion of Judah, as they call their emperor. Eucalyptus trunks, bamboo twigs, and grass for roofing. Over the centuries, the building material and the building style have not changed much in Ethiopia. There was no need to, since it stood the test of time. It requires a skilled builder and helpers capable of tying a good bamboo knot. A house like this one can be finished in about two weeks and should last close to 15 years. Harare is an historically rich Ethiopian province. Its capital, Harar, is Ethiopia's center of Islamic faith. It lies on important merchant routes connecting the Arab kingdoms and sub-Saharan Africa. The town lies in the Churcher Mountains. Coffee and kat, or mira, are grown in its vicinity. It seems as though everything in the Harare region has to do with this plant. Initially, it requires considerable care and its growers must wait three years to see the first worthwhile harvest. After that, it's harvested monthly. Villagers, growers, and merchants from near and far gather in the town of Awade, where the biggest mira market takes place, sort of like a stock market with precise rules and regulations. The grower brings his harvest to the market, the merchant evaluates it according to quality, and the bargaining ensues. As soon as a deal is made, the bunches are tied into large bundles. And why? The carefully selected shoots of mira, when chewed, release an amphetamine-like stimulant. This is caused by an alkaloid called cathinone, which brings on a pleasant feeling of relaxation, extends periods of activity at the expense of attention span, and reduces the feeling of heat and hunger. It's completely taken over the town of Awade, where coffee was initially cultivated. Perhaps it even saved the town. Business booms and people prosper. Mira will always be chewed. The tradition is so deep-rooted among the locals that it's almost easier to picture a Frenchman without wine or an Irishman without whiskey than a Harari without this chewable drug. Apparently, chewing Mira is now no longer exclusive to men. Dusk falls and feeding time comes. Each evening, Mr. Yusuf leaves for the savannah to see his hyenas. They all have names and are fed camel meat. The Harari people have maintained a close-knit relationship with hyenas over the centuries. Some even believe that they can rid themselves of evil spirits only by passing close to a hyena. Spotted hyenas were initially called the laughing hyenas because they emit a strange sound similar to human laughter. They are often considered to be scavengers, even though they are a feared predator. They have massive jaws, strong enough to crush elephant bones. The lion is the hyena's main competition in the food chain, and they often fight over prey. Sometimes, the hyenas steal a bit of the lion's kill, and sometimes, it's the other way around. Mr. Yusuf has been doing this his whole life. 
Hyenas can be dangerous and unpredictable, so please, don't try this at home. Jamaica lies to the south of Cuba, on the third largest island of the Greater Antilles. It's mostly mountainous, and the foothills are covered in an evergreen rainforest. Here lies the inconspicuous mountain town of Nine Miles. It's pretty similar to its neighbors, but a certain detail has brought it fame and fortune. The most famous reggae singer of all time, Bob Marley, was born here in the year 1945. Bob Marley is an idol, and the locals grow his favorite marijuana, the sacred herb of all Rastafarians and reggae lovers, in his honor. Bob Marley was born right here in this very house. Once you pay a fee, you may stroll where he was learning to walk or examine the collection of golden records and other musical artifacts. BBC declared Marley's song, One Love, the song of the millennium. Bob Marley's exceptional talent was discovered by an English producer from Jamaica, Chris Blackwell. From a poor boy, Bob became an international celebrity. He went so far as to live in one of the best addresses in Kingston. In the end, he ended up here. He died at age 36, and his remains are buried in a tomb not far from the house where he once lived. Here, important chapters of the country's history unfolded. Jamaica was discovered in 1492 by Christopher Columbus. It was then conquered by the Spaniards at the beginning of the 16th century, who wiped out the native Arawak people. In 1655, a decisive battle between England and Spain took place on this very beach, and Jamaica became part of the British Empire. The island gained its independence in 1962 and became part of the Commonwealth. The town of Orcabesa is yet another place sought out by tourists. Ian Fleming, the father of the famous agent James Bond, 007, built his villa nearby this beach, which is inaccessible to the public. Diehard fans can approach the villa James Bond style in secret. There's a stunning beach just below Fleming's villa with a fitting name, Goldeneye. Famous filmmakers from around the world come here for vacation. Whoever comes to Jamaica shouldn't miss this spectacular natural attraction, the Duns River Falls. The river forces its way through dense rainforest and route to the ocean, and overcomes countless cascades and rocky thresholds. Waterfalls are more than 600 feet high, about 180 meters. A favorite pastime of visitors is climbing to the top. The way up takes about three hours, but because it's in the shade and because you're surrounded the whole time by a fine mist, it makes for a refreshing walk. Just watch your step.
also a favorite venue for the locals, who prefer a quick dip in one of the natural pools or are happy enough with one of the small public beaches down below. Families come here for day trips during the weekend. Unlike what the name might suggest, the Blue Mountains are actually completely green. They're 20 kilometers north from the capital of Kingston, and the only blue thing about them is the surrounding sky. The highest peak here and in all of Jamaica is the Blue Mountain Peak, which is 2,256 meters high. It's also one of the highest points in the entire Caribbean. During clear weather, you can see all the way to Cuba from here. The people living in small villages usually travel to the capital for work, or they farm. There are excellent conditions here. It's cool and misty at altitude, but it never freezes. Vegetation thrives. Over 500 types of plants grow here. Many were brought along by the colonists. The Spaniards brought the royal palm from Cuba. Rhododendrons came all the way from the Himalayas. Eucalyptus comes from Australia. Bamboo, lilies of the valley, and ginger originate in the Far East, but what thrives best of all is coffee, brought from Ethiopia. Coffee cultivation has become a very profitable business. Jamaican coffee is one of the best and most expensive in the world. The Ramon Jablum coffee is grown in the Blue Mountains. Jablum is an acronym made up from the words Jamaica Blue Mountains. The landscape of southern Jamaica has a somewhat different character than the northern part of the island. The foothills of the Evergreen Mountains are well suited for the cultivation of wheat and for cattle farming. On one of the farms, racehorses are bred. Maroons live in the south of the islands. They are the descendants of black slaves brought over by the British from Africa who managed to escape into the mountains. They fought a long fight for freedom from colonial rule. They celebrate January 6th every year in memory of a peace treaty signed between their ancestors and British colonists in 1739. Part of the celebration is the pilgrimage to the sacred tree Kinda. The name is African and stands for one family. Timber was once floated into town on the river Martha Bray. Rafts were built then the same way they are built now, using bamboo. Today they are only used for tourist sightseeing groups. The raft men revere the Martha Bray River. She was the Indian empress of the Arawak people and knew where the entrance to a secret cave full of gold was. One day she lured greedy Spanish prospectors into the cave and then had it flooded. Now, the drowned men must guard the cave's secret for eons. According to one of the local captains, the river is navigated by some 80 rafts. Apparently, they are of exceptional quality, and the journey is usually smooth and safe. No piranhas or crocodiles live in the river. It isn't hard to build a raft. First, bamboo is cut down in the forest using a machete, 
and the bamboo rods are then tied together using wires and ropes. Within five days, the floating device is complete. Black River, the capital of the southwestern region, was named after a river that flows into the sea not far from here. It's one of Jamaica's longest rivers. The Spaniards once named it Rio Caubana, which means Mahogany River. In English, it was simply called Black because of the vegetation decomposing on the riverbed. Today, life flows relatively peacefully, but in the 19th century, this was one of Jamaica's busiest ports. The YS waterfalls lie on the Black River. Their name is composed of the initials of their previous owners, Sir Yates and Captain Scott. Surprisingly, the tourists in Jamaica come to the waterfall only rarely. Mostly locals from the town of Black River find their way up here and come to relax at this remote waterfall. Hopefully this place will resist the boom of the tourism industry as long as possible. Its pristine beauty deserves it. While navigating the Black River, it's possible to reach the Great Morass or Great Swamps. Mangroves are common tropical trees that grow on the banks with air roots reaching above the water's surface. Mangroves usually grow in river deltas on the seaside. They thrive in water that is neither too salty nor too fresh. Dry mangroves are dealt with by armies of termites. The mangrove wood is very hard, and so, while the tree is healthy, termites don't stand a chance. As soon as it dries out, however, they go to work. The swamps are an ornithologist's paradise. 300 types of birds live here, ranging from herons to flamingos and even ducks. With a little bit of luck, a hummingbird may be spotted. It's Jamaica's national bird. Some 75 crocodiles live on this 44-mile-long segment. Apparently, they're not really aggressive. On the contrary, they're rather shy. It may be wise, though, to remember that a crocodile is capable of crushing a cow with its jaws. Mangroves are extremely beneficial. For example, they are efficient at absorbing carbon dioxide. One hectare of mangroves turns 35 tons of waste into oxygen in a single year, an equivalent of what 20 vehicles emit in that same time period. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will visit the Missourian Lake District, which is an impressive water world in northeastern Poland. We will then trade in the cool Baltic region for the tropical Caribbean. Here we will prove that it would be wrong to link the Cuban province of Guantanamo only with the famous American naval base. To wrap things up, we will return to Europe's Mediterranean region to visit people of the Lipari Islands who continue to survive in the shade of ever smoldering volcanoes. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.